Okay, students, uh, let's begin lecture. Let me see if I can get a mic here. Okay. Okay. Uh, today's our, our lecture, our first lecture on black holes. And uh, I don't have a TA up here, so I gotta operate all this stuff. Uh, and I'm going to finish up with a few neutron star concepts uh, with you. Uh, but just uh, before we start, let me make a couple uh, announcements for the general good of everyone. It is considered cheating if you operate another person's eye clicker in class or on an exam. And there's ways for us to figure out that you're doing that. So don't do it. Now we've, we've already got uh, some trouble along that line. And I don't want any more of it. Uh, and we're going to be doing some clicking today. So if you've got somebody, I'm not looking at anybody. But if you've got somebody else's clicker. I'm extremely unhappy about it. And it's possible for you to say, Dr. B, uh, I'm going to do it anyway. That's fine. That's on you. Uh, I can't do anything about that. You just do what you think is right. That's all I can ask. Also, we have an exam coming up. I just cussed on the podcast. <laughs> well, it shows you how, you know, I'm not happy about it. Not a single bit. Uh, final exam next week. All right, 7 a.m. You newbie freshmen, don't screw it up. Get three alarm clocks. Call the president. See if he'll call you up at 6.30. And get your you-know-what in here. And I'm going to be here in time for the 7 o'clock final. So you better, if I'm here, you better be. All right? Now, you know what? There's one more thing I, I want to, about clickers. Uh... And this, and you might want to do a little bit of seat changing right now. We found out that in the afternoon section, a student had had trouble. Doctor B, why don't why doesn't my I'm I'm here every lecture. Why doesn't my you know my uh, clicking answers and my clicking correct figures in my grades page? Why doesn't that indicate that I've answered every question? And so so. That, so what we found is she had a, a, a clicker registration problem. We, we sorted that out, okay? Uh, in case you guys didn't realize it, the, in the middle of the semester, the iClicker company and the Canvas company uh, made a big mess up and the registration mechanism is all discombobulated. But most of you guys are registered already, so but there's a few people that got messed up. We squared her away. So she went back to her regular seat in the back of the auditorium. And I just asked one question on, Thursday, uh, on Tuesday last week. And, so, and I just happened to say, I don't always ask, I said, anybody have no base? You know, anybody having trouble clicking? And her hand, she's at, you know, back in the back row, she goes like, yeah, Dr. B, my, it's, not, it's, just, it's not clicking. So I said, all right, come on down to the front. And we'll check it for you. So she came down to the front. Everybody else was trying to figure out the answer. And she came down to the front. She was really embarrassed. But what we found was that her clicker worked perfectly in the front. And so you guys in the back, I'll give you a minute. If you want to move forward, there's plenty of seats up here. And you know, you know when we don't notice it on exams because everybody, I cram everybody into the first 10 or 12 rows or whatever it is. But you guys in the back three, three or four rows, you, 
It's up to you what you want to do. But if you want, I'll give you a minute if you want to redistribute yourself because you don't know. You know, you don't know if your clicks are clicking through. So go ahead and move if you want. I'll give you a minute. Nobody's moving. One person's moving. All right, good. Good. Yeah, if you're concerned, if you, you know, good. Another person moving. Yeah, just uh, the first 10 rows should be good. And uh, you, know, I, you know what it is? It's the batteries. If you've got those El Cheapo batteries from when you bought it, they are very unreliable and they have a history of, what I've noticed in the past is that they flake at suddenly. You know, you get, you get all the bars, and then all of a sudden, bang, you got zero power. So, uh, and I'm not sure, but they, it used to be you could operate them out in the parking lot. But I don't know, maybe they have a bad batch this semester or something like that. All right, you guys aren't moving. It's up to you. I gave you the scoop. All right. Uh, last time we talked about the shock wave that moves outward from the core of supernova, uh, collapse, core collapse supernova, uh, detonate, and forms the detonation. And I mentioned that this forms all the uh, elements above iron 56 in the periodic table. Uh, now, you may be saying to yourself, Dr. B, why have you got a picture of a supersonic jet forming sonic booms? Those are shock waves. You know, you know, so when you hear a shock, sonic boom, it's a shock wave. And this is a cool one because the atmospheric conditions are right, that the pressure variation, you get a, a very fast change, increase in pressure, and then decrease in pressure. And that forms a shock, condenses water in the atmosphere, and then it quickly evaporates. You see, you can see this image on the right. There's a, 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 a small cloud. Those are water droplets that form quickly in the shock, and then they dissipate, because behind it, you don't see, you know, that cone going back from the plane doesn't extend, you know, for 100 meters, just hardly beyond the tail of the plane. Anyway, so those are shock waves, all right? So they manufacture uh, all the elements uh, above iron 56, and sometimes they leave behind uh, I, th those core collapses, leave behind either a neutron star or a black hole. Now, we talked about neutron stars last time. I want to give you a few more uh, concepts. Uh, this is an image of something called the Vela supernova remnant. It's in the constellation Vela, which is southern hemisphere. Um, it's like the sails of... Uh, uh, I, b I believe it's Odysseus, the sailing ship that Odysseus used in the, in the Iliad, uh, or the Odyssey, I should say. Anyways, uh, so it's, it sails in. And so this is a remnant, and right in here, uh, let me change the lights a little bit. Hold on. Lighting. All right. Uh, right in here in this box is the actual remnant of the supernova. Now we're going to take a look at it closely. Uh, in that box is the Vela pulsar. And it's a famous pulsar in the Vela supernova remnant. And if you focus in closely, this is what you see. And this is an x-ray image. All right, and what you see are, it's kind of like a crossbow shape. You see these, uh, let me get my cursor over there. All right, this big white arrow points right to the neutron star itself. That little bright circle of light in there, there's a neutron star down in there, and we've got that figured out. These kind of um, 
almost circularly, circularly shaped arcs. They look like a crossbow, a flexed crossbow. Uh, those are shock waves, outgoing shock waves from the uh, neutron star itself. Uh, this, you can see like a kind of a cone-shaped or a triangular wedge-shaped area back here. That is called a jet. Go ahead and make a note of that. Neutron star, a jet in this direction. And up here is a jet in the other direction. And now look at this jet. It's sending out plumes of matter. And all these are hot in X-ray. So this is an X-ray image with one of our spacecraft that's got an X-ray telescope. You know, we got, we got stuff up there, you know, or on the ground looking at radio waves, infrared, microwave, uh, visible, of course, Roy G. Biv, uh, ultraviolet and X-ray and gamma ray, uh, even higher energy. And this is an X-ray image. And this plume of stuff We've actually seen it move. We, there's a movie, and your homework tonight, your, your little study assignment that I have set up, uh, is going to show um, uh, the movie. You're going to have a link to the movie where they've actually, over the course of uh, months and years, they've been able to see that plume move. Now, here's a couple uh, specs about this particular plume, the jet, and it's in both directions. The motion of the Vela Pulsar is in the direction of the jet. And specifically, it's moving towards this upper, in the direction of the upper jet. So the Vela Pulsar is moving up and to the right. And you may think to yourself, Dr. B, why is that significant? It's significant because what they found is that the velocity and the jet are perfectly aligned. You know, the jet goes off in opposite directions. But here's what happens. The one side of the jet is a little bit weaker and one side is a little bit stronger. So the stronger side of the jet, which is this, the back end over here, it acts like a rocket motor. You get a lot of, a lot of rocket motor um, exhaust going one way. The rocket itself goes the other way. And that's what's happening here. There's a little bit more power in this jet. And for that reason, the entire neutron star is moving. And it's spinning. So make a note. The spin rate is about 11 times per second. All right. Now the, the neutron star, and that's how we pick it up. And in your reading assignment, your little study page, it's not quite ready, but it'll be ready tonight. Your study page, you can add, they, they, they have a page uh, somewhere in California. Uh, somewhere in California that um, uh, translated the, um, the lighthouse uh, effect radiation, the pulse, which is electromagnetic, and they converted it into audio, so you can hear it as a kind of a buzz, uh, 11 times per second. All right, And they've got a bunch of different pulsars that they've done that for. It's kind of a cool page. Uh, the particles in the jet, that plume, for instance, is moving at 70% of the speed of light. Go ahead and make a note of that. It is motating. 70% of this, we can, we can hardly do that. You know, we can do that with electrons and protons here on Earth. We can get it up to 99.9%. Uh, but with, you know, you know, many, many millions and zillions of metric tons of matter, you know, no way we could, could we do that. But this neutron star, it's blasting stuff. And because it has so much kinetic energy, it can, manuf it can form exotic fusion reactions and manufacture all the rest of the periodic table. So it's happening up there in that shock and, and, and all around the star as well. Um, the length of the forward jet, that wispy one, is about um, a little bit less than a light year. All right, so make a note. You can actually make a sketch of this. And this, is the, this is the Vela Pulsar 
The x-ray image, this is as close down as we can get with our x-ray images. And the length of it, so from the white arrow out to, I don't know, out to about here or so, that's about a light year, okay, to the end of that wispy plume. And the problem, you know, the thing is that plume is changing with time. You know, it's just kind of, you know, when you see the movie tonight and you look at it, it's, it's going to be pretty cool. Now, we know approximate size and mass of this neutron star. We've got that measured. And the density, um, and here it is in kilograms per cubic meter, uh, 1.3 times 10 to the 17. All right. So go ahead and write that number down. And, you know, you're not going to have to memorize it. But I do want you to compare it to the density of regular water. Good old SMOW here on Earth, uh, Michaela. Uh, one times 10 to the 3 kilograms per cubic meter. So what we've got here with the neutron star is ultra, ultra dense material. It's a trillion, 100 trillion times more dense than water. Now, water is pretty dense. You know, this, this little table here where the document camera up here, um, that's maybe a cubic meter or so, maybe a little less. If, this, if we had a container this size filled with water, that would be one metric ton, a thousand kilograms. Water's pretty dense, all right? But a neutron star, forget about it. It's a hundred trillion times more dense. So, you know, as I've mentioned before, the neutron star compresses the, ma the mass of a, you know, the, the remnant mass of a star after the detonation into something the size of Orange County. That's the size of it. The neutron star is, is smushed down by the core collapse into a neutron star, you know, not a white dwarf into a, you know, white dwarfs are pretty dense too, but a neutron star, oh my goodness. Now, I, to, to help you visualize this, here's an image of like the Orlando area. So here's Sanford up here at the top. Uh, here's Lake Apopka over here on the right. Downtown Orlando's over here, kind of in the middle. Uh, Disney's down here, I guess, somewhere, Lake Buena Vista. Uh, Kissimmee's not on there. Um, Bithlo is over here. And UCF is right up in here, if I read that correctly. Uh, yeah, right around in here. All right, so now... What I did was I made, um, I used a, a, a website called uh, GPS Visualizer, and I made a circle about the size of a neutron star, the Vela Pulsar, and I centered it at UCF. So we're going to focus in right here on the UCF area. Here it is. Okay. Now that is a circle. Now look at that. That doesn't even, it, it doesn't even reach downtown Orlando. If it's centered right here on campus, so we're getting squished out by a neutron star, right? Okay, so we're toast. But anyways, the, the, the shadow, if, you know, if the sun's directly overhead, the shadow's going to be, I don't know. And there's Oviedo Mall up there. Uh, Chuliota. And... Waterford Lakes down here at the bottom. So it's, it's not that big. But yet we can see those babies halfway across the visible universe, especially when they go supernova. You know, the detonation itself is really amazing. And we, we love to see those. That's how we figure out the Big Bang and stuff. So that's about the size of it. Now, here's another one. M1, Messier object one, number one. Uh, also known as the Crab Nebula in the constellation Taurus. Now, this one I want you to just visually look at this. All right. Now, this is a composite image with some Hubble, some infrared, some X-ray stuff here that I'm going to show you uh, for the Crab Nebula. And we've talked about this one before. This is one of the most famous objects that astronomers have studied over the years. 
And let me park this over here to the left a little bit. And now I'm going to bring in, um, I'm going to focus in on the x-ray core. All right, now watch this. Here it comes. You watching? Wake him up. Yeah, watch what we got. We're looking at the x-ray core here. All right, here it comes. There it is. That's the x-ray core. That's the x-ray image, false color blue, in x-ray of the... Basically, that's, that's what's uh, the remnants of the, uh, the neutron star and all the trouble that the neutron star. So let me... Um, so that's an x-ray image. Let me park it over here to the right. All right. And so when we look at x-rays in the Crab Nebula, that's what we see. Now that's a little bit bigger, all right? It's a little bit close. It's easier for us to see. We can't see that much detail uh, for Vela, but you know, we're, we're getting good details from Vela, but this one's a little bit more. You can, you can see the, you know, the circular, you can see the jets, you know, kind of a, a little jet down here coming out the tail end. It's kind of tilted away from us. So, uh, this, you know, it, there's just zillions of things to study uh, about neutron stars and supernova remnants. Now, uh, there's a nice little study page. Oh, did I say study? Yes. And by the way, the final exam. Are you awake? The final exam, cumulative. That means everything since... Uh, August, right? Everything. Mandatory. You got to be, this is, you don't drop this one. So you can't say, oh, well, I'll drop the final. I'll let that be my best two out of three. I'll drop that one. No, no, that, that's only midterms. Final, you got to get your, you know what in here, 7 a.m., and it's, you know, everything is, you know, my condolences for 7 a.m. final, but that's just the way it is. Here, yeah. Question up in the front. Do you use the same Scantron? The answer is yes. The raspberry flavored scant, ra <laughs> raspberry colored Scantron. Uh, and we're going to be using both sides of it. So we might have 90 questions. 50 on the front, 40 on the back, almost fill up the back. And then, uh, you know, 10 or, 10 or 15 points, something like that with the clickers. All right. So you got to have your clicker. Now, uh, as I say, I, I've got the, a little study page for you to, you know, read up and just get started, you know, looking at black holes and pulsars too. Uh, and it's not, it's not available yet, but I, I have, still have a few things to uh, fix up for it. But hopefully tonight you'll be able to look at that. And that'll be helpful. Now, I want to go through some black hole concepts with you. And your first question here, I want you to, it's a clicker question coming up. Uh, and I, what I want you to do is to answer to the best of your uh, preference, the next question. Because it's really, you know, which is your favorite? So go ahead and, and everybody will get points for each answer on this one. Which is your favorite black hole concept? And there's a bunch of them there. So go ahead and make a, a vote. I want to see what you guys vote for here. So um, everybody's going to get um, a correct answer on this one, so that's good. But just you know, just tell me what you think is the favorite or the one that makes more sense to you. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero, okay? 
And uh, this is interesting. Let me switch over. Uh, okay. Yeah, so a bunch of you voted for A. Um, majority of you voted for D. That's interesting. Now, um, it, 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 and just to, to remind you, this is like a public opinion survey, so it's not like, um, you know, you, you know, but the point of the matter is you're all wrong. If you voted for anything there, they're all a misconception. Now, I didn't do that to trick you, but I did, you know, I, I want to see which one you were thinking about. And this shows you, you know, like if, if you go to a movie and, you know, in and, and Hollywood, science fiction movie, you know, you know, something about a black hole, you're liable, uh, unless very few movies actually have somebody that knows about black holes advising them. But a lot of times, oh yeah, well, a black hole, you're going to come out into another universe and all this stuff. Forget it. You go into a black hole, you're toast. So, uh, and we'll talk about that probably on Thursday. By the way, uh, Thursday, we're going to have our second lecture on black holes. And then the last 20 minutes or so, we'll have a special eye clicker review that you'll do in self-paced mode like we do on exams. But you'll have 15 or 20, you'll have a handout. And you can do it with your neighbor and just kind of a little mini review. And what I normally do is convert that into a few bonus points. And for those of you that have not been to the observatory, and I know, you know, some of you have tried, and sometimes the weather doesn't cooperate, uh, you can still get some bonus point action from being in class with your clicker uh, on Thursday. So uh, also... Thursday or Friday, I'll release a big uh, mega review homework assignment in web courses, uh, it, you know, like a study tool, and it'll be due, uh, let's see, your guys final is on the 7th, I think, right? Okay, so it'll, uh, the other guys have it due on the 5th, they're, they're, so it'll be due on the 5th, um, or maybe the night before. Um, and, it, you know, like a study tool. And, and I'll convert your score on that. Hopefully you get 100%. I'll convert your score on that into some bonus points. And so if you've missed out with going to the observatory, and I know a few of you, you know, you, you messed up, you couldn't make it, or if you want to get some more bonus points, um, you could definitely do this and if you're in web courses. All right, now I've got another question for you. Uh, and this one does have a correct answer. This is all related to black holes. Uh, how far does a photon of light move in one second? 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six. If you don't know this, you got to... Seven, six, wait a minute, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay, so this is a nice easy one. Easy and cheesy. Um, yeah, uh, one light second. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up, you know, I've 70% of you got that one right. Whoa, somebody voted for light year. No, that's how, that's how far light goes in a year. But in one second, it's one light, one light second. That's usually how we refer to it. Uh, now, I want to um, go over this with you because with light, go ahead and jot this down in your notes. It's not in my slide. Light always travels at sea. 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. C is a constant. So if you're in a, in a rocket ship that's moving at half the speed of light and you beam a laser out the front end of your, your spaceship, that laser beam doesn't travel at 1.5 times the speed of light. It just travels at the speed of light. 
and it gets blue shifted. That's what happens. If you if you be, you know if you're traveling at half the speed of light and you beam a, a laser beam, um, Jennifer, out the back end of your spaceship, the light beam doesn't you know the light the photons don't go at half the speed of light. They just get red shifted. All right. Now, that being the case. I want to start building uh, something called a space-time diagram. All right, so let's make a sketch here. And traditionally, in relativity, we make the vertical axis the time axis, the temporal axis. All right? And so label your vertical axis in seconds, and then the horizontal one in light seconds, LS. All right? And this is a special kind of diagram called a space-time diagram because Einstein's theory of relativity is based on this fact that we consider time itself to be the fourth dimension. And you know, not some separate thing that you, you know, like you, you go down to the store and you buy space, three spatial dimensions up and down left to right, forward and back, and then you got to go to another store, you know, down the street and get some time. No. Do you get them all in the same store? They're all relative dimensions in space and time, like they say on Doctor Who. All right? So time is the fourth dimension. So let's treat it that way. We'll put it on a diagram. And we'll map stuff out on it. Now let's take a look at this. Go ahead and... Um, down towards the bottom here, uh, go up one second and give yourself a little bit of room. We're going to mark out one second, two seconds, and three seconds on the temporal axis. Now, in one second, we just, we just answered this question, a photon of light, if it starts down here at the origin of the coordinates, uh, Alex, in one second it's going to be one light second away. All right, so mark the, you know, mark a vertical line there, right? One light second out to the right. And then put a dot or something. I got a red circle there. For the location of the photon at one second of travel. You know, so it starts here, down at the origin, and one second later, bing, it's up here. All right? Now, hopefully you got a little bit of room uh, on your graph. If you don't, make a bigger sketch. Go to the next page of your notebook or something. Um, let's do two seconds. All right. So try to space it evenly up there, you know, you know the same size vertical uh, as the one second line, but another, you know, right above there. And then in two seconds, that photon of light, you know, little H alpha photon, zip zap. Two light seconds, ding, go ahead and put in a dot there. With this scale, you know, using light seconds and then time on the vertical, every, for, for things that are moving at the speed of light, you got a piece of cake here. It's easier than eating a piece of pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. Hey, wait a minute. Is this the first day back for Thanksgiving? Yeah. I hope everybody had a nice Thanksgiving day. Plenty of pumpkin pie and stuff like that. All right, let's go up to three seconds. Is it getting boring yet? <laughs> I heard somebody say, yeah, back in August it got boring. Yeah, okay, wise guys. Anyways, three seconds, three light seconds of distance. Bing, put a dot up there. Uh... And you guys, uh, in general, um, just go ahead and kind of sketch in easily uh, a 45-degree line. You know, so what, you know, whatever time you, you choose, you know, you can just say, all right, at, at 1.73 seconds, it's, you know, on this 45-degree line. All right. Or alternatively, you can add this in if you want. You can keep your uh, 40, I'm keeping my 45 degree line, but I'm getting rid of those guidelines, the, the vertical and horizontal guidelines. Um, and I could, you could write in the coordinates if you want. You know, the first one is one light second, comma, one second. 
It's this for the, for the first dot, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in this coordinate system, um, uh, light is always going to be on a 45 degree line. And what we're, you know, we're, we're talking about, I'm laying the groundwork so you can get a handle on black holes. And if you want to understand black holes, you really definitely want to think about the motion of light. You know, all those misconceptions, oh, well, I'm going to go into another dimension and, you know, and, you know, in this other universe, uh, uh, Mr. Spock is, is going to be a poet and, and Captain Kirk is going to be evil and all, you know, that's all Hollywood stuff. But to really understand black holes, we want to think about uh, light. And so uh, just to reinforce in this scale, scales of this kind, uh, light's path is always mapped on 45 degrees. Now, um, on this particular uh, diagram, uh, positive X would be, you know, off to the right. I mean, if you're thinking about it that way, you know, positive X over here. Leftward would be negative X. And we could map out leftward moving photons if we want. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, so here's, here's our, go ahead and extend, or draw another picture if you want. Extend the uh, spatial axis to the left. And let's get a photon line 45 degrees over there. All right. So if you have leftward going photons, they're going to be somewhere on that, that tilt, that 45 degree line, the red dashed line over there on the left side. Okay, no problema. Now this is where we're just thinking um, lefty and righty, you know, single spatial dimension and then the temporal dimension. Now in a minute, we're going to put another spatial dimension in. All right, but before we do that, uh, let's think about this line. Go ahead, and, go ahead and sketch in a line over there on the left. And kind of tilt it almost to the 45 degree line, but slightly above it. You know, just kind of eyeball it in. And that's the, that's the path in space time of something going at constant speed to the left. All right. And go ahead and, and uh, trace in, and that's a leftward, um, that's a leftward moving object. So that's, that's what we would call its path in space time. Uh, there's all kinds of fancy terms for it. Now, go ahead and sketch in one here, uh, a little bit steeper, and I've got it marked in black. Uh, that's something that's going to the right. All right. Now make that a little bit steeper than the blue one. And the blue one is a little bit steeper than the 45 degree photon line. All right. So everything's hunky dory here. Now I'm going to ask you another clicker question. Here it is. Which object is moving faster? Leftward, rightward, or are they going at the same speed? Or is it impossible to tell? Go ahead and vote. Make a decision. I'm going to be real interested to see your answers on this. Twenty seconds. And I can hear you guys talking and consulting. Good. Think. Think about what you're answering. Ten seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh 
Let's see what you guys. Oh my goodness. Nobody voted. For, we didn't. We didn't get a majority. We got a forty-one and a forty-four. Uh, more people voted for leftward than rightward, but it's pretty close. Uh, some people said both at the same speed, and three people said impossible to tell. Uh, my wonderful students, it is not impossible to tell. The correct answer is uh, A. And here's how you tell. The slope of the line, the slope of the path, you know, it's tilt angle, if you will. That tells you the speed relative to the speed of light. Now, let me point something out to you here. If you... This is where you are. You're at the center of the coordinates. And you send a beam of red H alpha photons to the right. That's this line. You send a beam of H alpha photons to the left. That's this other line. And you're right here. You're right on the time axis. You ain't going nowhere. You're just sitting there looking at stuff. All right? So if you're stationary... Go ahead and make a note of this. If you are stationary, you're holding the clock, you're on the time axis. The time axis is defined by the observer. All right, now if you're an observer, you're seeing things moving away from you. The one on the left is so if you're if you're stationary your your trajectory through space time is straight up no problem with that if you're moving at the speed of light you're tilted all the way over to 45 degrees now you can't go faster than the speed of light so you have to be somewhere between straight up and tilted at 45 degrees and the and here's so here's the kicker here's how you decide the closer you are to 45 degrees the faster let me repeat that. The closer you are to the 45 degree line, the faster. All right? Now, on this same diagram, I want to add just a one more concept for you. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light. So you're never going to see a trajectory in space-time of a physical object that's dipped below the 45-degree line. You're not going to find that. Right? Einstein said, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. That's basically the special theory of relativity. So all this area down here, just kind of shade that in somehow and write the word no. From where you start, you can kick something to the left on the blue line. You can kick something to the right and send it motating out to the right on the black line. Or you can beam out photons to the right or photons to the left. But you can't get anything dipped below the red lines. You know, the four, to the 245 degree lines, right? Same thing over here. You can't get anything over there. You can't get stuff moving faster than the speed of light, right? Now, this is where we start thinking about the guts of a black hole because if you've ever heard of the law of causality, cause and effect, it's a profound idea. This is how it looks geometrically. You are right here. This is you. At time t equals zero, you're at x equals zero. You can kick things to the left on the blue line or somewhere else. 
You can kick things to the right, you know, toss a baseball to the right, toss a baseball to the left. Toss a photon to the right, toss a photon to the left. But there's no, so if somebody's off to the left and you time it right, you can bop them with a, well, not with a baseball, you don't want to do that because it might give them a concussion. But you know, like a water balloon, okay? So you get a water balloon traveling at, at the speed of light or a little bit slower, you can bean them either left or right. But not, you, you can't bean somebody that's down over here in the gray area. All right? So if they're over here to the right, you're not going to be able to bean them until uh, somewhere up here in the, in the right, or in the white area. All right? So this is the, what we would say, your, your causal future, the causal future of T equals zero is inside this, these two 45 degree lines. Let me repeat that for you. The causal future, the things in the future, the events in the future that you can affect, you know, with a, with a, a water balloon less than the speed of light or with a photon at the speed of light, the stuff that you can affect, the causal future of t equals zero, x equals zero is inside this triangle, the upper part of the triangle. Now, in two spatial dimensions, this is just one on this diagram, if now you think of the y-axis, for instance, going um, out of the screen and into the screen, you have something that we call the light cone. Now, here's, here's a I just Googled light cone in, in Google Images, and here's one of them that came up. Now, this is what we've got. You know, the future light cone is in green, the past light cone. Everything that can affect you at time t equals zero, this is your causal past that's in the red. Nothing outside of that light cone can affect you. And you can affect nothing outside the green causal future. All right? Here's another picture of the light cone. This one's kind of perspective. All right, so two spatial dimensions. So try to copy one of these down or kind of sketch it. All right. And so when, so what, and, and this is a tool that physicists the world over use to study the curvature of space time. You, did you know that there are um, time travel theories that are kosher, they're righteous? Then the way to understand them, light cones. Now, we're not, that's something called the Gadol universe, uh, spinning universe. Uh, and it does things to space time that allow you to travel forward into your past, travel into the future direction and arriving at your past. Kind of weird. All right? it's, it's kosher. It's called a closed time light curve. Here's another picture of it. It's kind of another picture perspective, a little shading and stuff. All right, so kind of draw one of these. But yeah, light cones, uh, they're like, you know what they're like? They're like a, they're like a, a thermometer. They're like a, a tool that you always use when you're trying to think about, you know, when you're, you know, the weather channel. They're always talking about Temperature and barometric pressure. Okay, light cones are like that. We're always talking about them in relativity. Here's another picture. It's kind of a nice one. You see movies. This one's actually a GIF, an animated GIF, but I, I just took one slice of it out. Um, all right, another question for you. Let's just see if you've retained anything. Uh, okay, on graph paper. Okay, go ahead and vote. <laughs> I forgot to animate this one. <laughs> you better get it right. I'll give it to you. No, don't vote eight. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, go ahead and get those in. 
It happens every once in a while. All right, good. All right, 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, good. Yeah, so just remember that 45 degrees, either left or right. And go ahead and make another sketch if you want. Um, everything inside the light cone is slower than the speed. It's moving at the speed of light. Or if it's right on the spine, the symmetry axis of the light cone, it's at rest. That's you. That's, you're the observer. You, you got a wristwatch and you got some eyeballs. Question. So the visible universe gets inside the light cone? Everything that we can see. Other people are going to be inside. You know, somebody at Alpha Centauri is going to have a different light cone. You know. So, so you know what it's like? It's like, it's like how we say that, you know, the light from a distant galaxy takes 10,000 years to get here. That means we can't see anything from that galaxy until, until 10,000 years have passed. So if that other galaxy is way over here to the right, we're not going to see anything from it until its light cone intersects ours way up here, you know, vertically up there. So, you know, you know, if your light cone is fairly close, there's going to be overlap and stuff and, you know, but different, but if it's just you, yep, that's the only thing, there's the only things that you'll ever be able to observe or affect. That's your causal future. Question. Yeah. What's the third dimension? Well, the third dimension is that you mean in the in the di these diagrams back here, like like this one here. The the two spatial dimensions, the circle, the the yellow circle there, is in the x y plane. All right, and the 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 axis that goes right up the spine of the cone. Right up the symmetry axis, that's the temporal axis, that's time. Okay? So. All right, next question. Um, geometry class. Do you remember about 60 degree right triangles? Or excuse me, 60 degrees. Uh, equilateral triangles. So you aim two photons along lines that are 60 degrees apart. You start them from the same point down there to the lower right. After two seconds. Now, after two seconds, we know each one goes two light seconds. That we already know. But how far apart are they? You know, so that's the yellow question mark. Go ahead and vote for that. Think. And talk to your neighbor if, you, if you're a little rusty on your geometry. It's basically a geometry question. Ten seconds to fifteen seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, okay, yeah, most of you got this one right. It's just jot down the three locations form a, uh, an isosceles, excuse me, an equilateral triangle. Uh, so that distance across the, the dotted line, that's two light seconds too. If it's equal, if it's, a, if it's um, in a flat plane and it's equal angles, it'll be equilateral. Okay, so 60, 60, and 60. Uh, all right, now. Let's get down to some of the concepts. We've done a lot of questions, a bunch of pictures. 
Let's get a little outline going here. Now, normally photons travel, as we say, in straight lines. Here on Earth, photons, you know, they go from point A to point B along a straight line. You could use a ruler to sketch it. One light second for every second of travel in space. Now, if you have some curvature in space-time, you know, and not just a black hole, but neutron stars have enough density that you have to take into account the curvature of space-time for them as well. Um, and even the SUN, it has a fairly weak, small amount of curvature, but we can measure it. I'm going to show you how that's done, or show how that has been done in the past. Now, let's talk about how they spread out. In one nanosecond, now not a second, but a nanosecond, uh, a photon travels about 30 centimeters. That's about 12 inches. Okay? So if you have a one nanosecond burst of like H alpha, all right, your H alphas are blazing out of your light source for a nanosecond, and we can do that in the lab, you know, our equipment. Uh, you're, it's going to form a shock wave of photons about 12 inches thick. All right. You know, and, you know, we were just looking at a, a big, huge, thick shock wave from a neutron star from a supernova detonation. But, yeah, I mean, if you want, you know, little teeny burst, nanosecond, photons. Yeah, 12 inches thick. All right, so now let's make a sketch of this. All right, so there's my source. Okay, so like the surface of the SUN. And there's my outgoing shock wave. Okay, and no matter how far out it is, I didn't really give a distance out, but I do want to emphasize the thickness of the shock wave, however far out it is is going to be about 12 inches. Now you, so you turn on your laser for a nanosecond. We could do that easily. Um, you're going to get a 12-inch um, shock wave. And every second, that shock wave will be another light second away from its origin, and it will be spreading out. So make a note of that. Now, you may think yourself, Dr. B, everybody knows this. Well, I'm about to pour a big blast of cold water on your brain. Because this all seems common sense. You know, every second, 12-inch shockwave, another light second away from the origin spreading out. Uh, Dr. B, boring... Yeah, but not if you're near the event horizon of a black hole. So this thing here, every second you get another uh, light second away from the origin. Not if you're near the event horizon of a black hole, and it's the space-time curvature that does it. So let's keep talking about a black hole. Now, we know that mass is left over after a supernova core collapse. Uh, and if you have maybe three times the mass of the sun or more, you might get a neutron star. Uh, or if, if you're heavier than a neutron st star can support with what we call neutron degeneracy pressure. In other words, you can't cram neutrons together uh, only except, you know, so dense before they start fighting back. But eventually that outward degeneracy pressure won't be able to sustain it against collapse, and then you get a black hole. Now go ahead and write down this idea. that The black hole collapses down to zero volume. So, you know, I gave you a, a little um, uh, blurb there about the density of a neutron star the matter in a neutron star, 100 trillion times de more dense than the density of wa liquid water. Uh, but 
if you shrink all, you know, like that neutron star, if you could shrink the Vela uh, neutron star down to zero volume, you know, so whatever, however many kilograms, that's in the numerator, the volume is in the denominator, but how do you divide by zero? Only Chuck Norris can do that. Okay, and apparently he's done it twice. So, uh, but normally zero volume, that means like infinity. So we're starting to get into some weird stuff here. Okay, now here's a common description of a black hole. Um, nothing, not even light can escape from a black hole. That's correct. You know, the escape velocity for, um, you, know, ro you know, a rocket that we send to the moon, we have to have big engines, big rocket uh, motors for that, and a lot of fuel so that we can get something out of Earth's gravitational pull uh, and up to the moon. So escape velocity, yeah. Um, some objects are so dense, you know, Earth's got a finite uh, escape velocity. It's not that, not that big. But a black hole, uh, it's greater than the speed of light. Another thing, here's another common and, and righteous way of describing a black hole, not like those misconceptions that we had before. Uh, the event horizon of a black hole marks the point of no return. So that if you, if you cross inside the event horizon, you ain't getting out, right? That is a righteous concept. However, there's other ways to describe the event horizon of a black hole, and it involves um, photons of light and light cones. And that's what we're, and this is actually the best way to describe it. Uh, one way to describe it is geometric. In in four dimensions, and you know, a student asked earlier about, well, what's the other dimension, Dr. B? Uh, how do you draw, here's, how, here's the question, how do you draw a four-dimensional light cone? You can't do it. I mean, unless you have a four-dimensional blackboard or something like that, which we currently don't have. Another way is thinking in terms of entropy, and this is the information theory of black holes. The amount of information that you can send and receive uh, to another observer or to a friend, um, that amount of information, um, send and receive, the whole idea of send and receive information. So the, in other words, the number, the number of uh, bytes of data that you can transmit per second as you approach the event horizon, that's where it starts to get interesting and that's what we're going to be talking about. And all of those are related to what photons do. All right. Now, I, we've got another few minutes. Let's get down and take the first look at what photons do. Now, um, if space time is flat, we know what happens. Photons just go straight on through just like normal. So if you're on the Earth and you're looking at some star and you're just looking out into space, the photon that you see, it just came in on a straight line. You know, unless it grazes past the sun. If there's a region of curvature along the path of the photon. So let's put the sun up here on the path. If you've got something like this going, that photon is going to be affected by the curvature near the sun. It's pretty weak, but we can see it. We've measured it. Right, so what happens is this. Um, the photon will respond to gravity even though it doesn't have any mass. A photon is formally massless. M is equal to zero exactly. It's not just really tiny. We can't measure it. It's actually zero. All right? But it still responds to the curvature of space-time. And how does it do it? It's like this. If this photon on the dotted line, now that photon starts out at a different angle. And it would normally, you know, miss the earth. It starts out tilted upward just a little bit. It would miss the earth. But because it grazes past the SUN, what happens is 
the starlight is deflected. We call it lensing. And they actually observed this in 1919, the first verification of Einstein's theory of relativity. They observed the deflection of starlight in a total eclipse in 1919. It was the first verification. And so you don't see this photon here. That one's going to plow into the sun. You shouldn't see, you shouldn't even see the star at all because it's physically behind the sun. But because of lensing, you do see this one. It's curved, it's going around the horn. It's going around the edge of the sun and then bending down towards the earth where it goes into your telescope. So the first one, no, you don't get to see that. But the other one you shouldn't be able to see, but because of the curvature of space-time near the surface of the sun, yeah, we can see that one. And here's where, here's where the sun appears, where that star appears to be. You know, we're, we tilt our, our telescope out there, but the star's not there, but that's where the photon appears to come from. The star looks like it's out there. So if you're looking at the sun during an eclipse, the stars are going to move out just a little bit. You're going to see stars from behind. They're going to, they're going to appear you know, slightly out from the edge. You shouldn't see them at all, but if they're, if they're just the right angle and everything, you'll see a few from behind the sun. And that's what we call gravitational lensing. Now, let's get back to our one nanosecond light pulse. Go ahead and draw a sphere of uh, flash bulbs. We're making them blue. They're blue flash bulbs, but they're going to give off a red uh, H alpha blaze for one nanosecond. Here it is. All right. Now, this is out there in flat space-time, and those babies, they just go on out, you know. Here we go. You know, they just follow this path. Uh, so here it is a little bit later. There's my 12-inch shock wave of H-alphas. And here's the key. You get more divergence per second. Now, we did that 60-degree triangle, but if, if you have them tilted out, you know, if you're looking at photons that aren't 60, you get a little trig to do, but it's, it's, it's not too bad. But it, basically, you're going to get more divergence per second. All right, so write that sentence down. All right? Now, that's in flat space-time. So write down flat space-time. Everything normal. No black holes. No neutron stars, not even the SUN is nearby. Now let's do the same sphere of blue flash bulbs, but now at the event horizon of a black hole. All right, so let's blaze it out. There's my, there's my 12 inch, one nanosecond blaze. And they want to go in this direction. You know, they try to follow these trajectories. You know, they're trying. Dr. B, I'm trying. But they don't diverge if they're emitted from the event horizon. So this idea that of gravitational lensing at the event horizon, they converge so quickly... They don't even diverge. They're, they're, they should be diverging. But they're lensed into each other by the curvature of space-time. They never get any bigger. They're trapped. And that is what we call a trapped surface. And that is the definition of a black hole, the event horizon of a black hole. A trapped surface. A, trap, a surface of trapped photons. They're, they're heading outward. They'd like to go outward. They're aimed in the right direction. But no matter how fast 
you know, how long they go, they ain't getting any further apart. There's no divergence. And here's, <laughs> here's something else that happens. Light bulbs inside the event horizon. They travel inevitably to R equals zero, the very center of the black hole. Now the event horizon's out here, the very center of the black hole, that's where the singularity is. Uh, everything, if you're inside it, they all, they, they don't turn around. They, they're, you know, they're aimed outward, but they never go anywhere except R equals zero. So we got a lot of strange troubles. Um, let me stop here. And uh, it's 1020. And we'll start with spherical coordinates uh, on Thursday. You're dismissed. I'll see you next uh, time.